Let me introduce myself. I am a proud Queenslander and a very proud Australian. My parents were European-born refugees from the Nazis just before the outbreak of World War II and could not have been more proud of their adopted country. They wanted me to take every opportunity available from the superb education system and this led me into medicine at the University of Queensland. However, driven by an insatiable appetite to have the best of the best, I moved to Melbourne to study ophthalmology at the Royal Victorian Eye and Ear Hospital, although Queenslanders at that time were only tolerated at this venerable institution. I was fortunate enough to be granted a travelling fellowship from the Royal Australian New Zealand College of Ophthalmologists to the US, and although this was just for six weeks, I spent the next 11 years in the USA absorbing all that I could about the latest techniques. How six weeks extended into 11 years is another story. Too long for this short video. However, I spent an interesting seven years at the illustrious Johns Hopkins Hospital Eye Department, known as the Wilmer Institute, one of the largest eye departments in the US at the time and then four years as the head of a small eye department, the Bethesda Eye Institute at St. Louis University, before returning to Brisbane to become the inaugural Professor of Ophthalmology at the University of Queensland. On my return, I was surprised to find that pterygium was so commonly seen. I had virtually never seen a pterygium in my 11 years in the US, However, in a population-based study in Nambour, just outside of Brisbane, I identified that a pterygium was present in 10% of the population over the age of 18. This makes it one of the most common diseases of the eye. I was similarly surprised to find that the most common way of removing a pterygium was to undertake this in an outpatient setting using the least skilled ophthalmic trainee and then sending the patient to the Queensland Radium Institute for radiotherapy. In the public system, this appeared to be fairly routine. However, at this time, no one had the slightest idea how often the treatment would come back following this method of treatment. When a research assistant and I determined that the recurrence rate was over 40%, it became plain that something better needed to be developed to treat pterygium. This started me on a 30-year quest to find something better for patients in Queensland and in Australia. I was also shocked to see that the existing treatments at that time, particularly radiotherapy, could result in sight-threatening complications. And in fact, I saw a number of patients who were blinded by this treatment. Although radiotherapy is very uncommonly used in Australia today for pterygium, it has, in many instances, been replaced by the use of a chemotherapy drop called mitomycin, which itself can result in blindness. The attraction for ophthalmologists to use radiotherapy or mitomycin is the speed and simplicity of the surgery, but all it offers the patient in comparison with other treatments is just the potential for serious possible complications. It is as though pterygium is a trivial disease as seen by most ophthalmologists and it doesn't warrant serious research and treatment. I investigated a number of potential variations on existing treatments, but it was 10 years before I developed a technique with which I was happy and with which my patients were also happy because of the near zero recurrence rate and no sight threatening complications. This method, which I cheekily named perfect for pterygium, as it is clearly not perfect, nor is any surgery perfect, is however revolutionary with respect to results. It is a major modification of a pre-existing technique 
known as pterygium surgery with autoconjunctival transplant, which has been in use since the 1970s. The surgery consists of three stages. The first stage is removal of the pterygium and most importantly removal of the roots of the pterygium which extend back close to the muscle, which turns the eye inwards. This tissue is known as tenon's layer. It is this extensive removal of these roots which is both difficult but necessary to prevent recurrence. This is not usually undertaken by surgeons using routine pterygium surgery with a graft. This stage of the surgery results in a large bare area overlying the muscle and above and below the muscle, which must be covered both to prevent recurrence but just as importantly to provide a cosmetic result. The second stage consists of retrieving a piece of tissue from the surface of the eye above the crystal window or cornea, which will then be used to transplant into the bare area created by the removal of the pterygium and its roots. This stage of surgery is quite difficult as it requires a meticulous dissection and separation of the thinnest, almost transparent piece of tissue, leaving the underlying tissue untouched. This area heals by itself over the next two weeks, and a further graft can be retrieved from this area within 6 to 12 months, if a second pterygium has to be removed from the same eye. In 1 in 100 patients, a pterygium may grow from the ear side of the eye and if they also have a pterygium on the nose side of the eye, then they will require two surgeries 6 to 12 months apart. The third stage is where this dissected thin tissue, the conjunctival autograft, is sutured in to reconstruct the bare area where the pterygium and roots were removed. The use of glue is impossible with this surgery as the graft is much larger than the grafts used by other surgeons. Frequently, six to eight times the area of routine grafts and sutures are required to obtain the best cosmetic results. As well, this method does not require the use of chemo drops such as mitomycin which can potentially result in sight-threatening complications. This method of surgery known as perfect for pterygium is now recognized across the world as one of the best methods of pterygium surgery ever developed. It is published in the scientific literature and has been presented at the largest meeting of eye doctors in the world the American Academy of Ophthalmology for almost 15 years. Patients from all around the world now come to Australia for this surgery. In fact, my research over 30 years into pterygium has been recognised by the University of Queensland, which awarded me with one of their highest degrees, a Doctor of Science. Unfortunately, it is not a simple surgery and requires significant training to be able to undertake it successfully. Having undertaken more than 3,500 such operations, I was in a position to try to identify ophthalmologists who would be interested in learning this technique. Learning surgical techniques is definitely only possible as an active participant in that surgery and cannot be learned from a lecture, video or book. Not dissimilar to learning a trade such as carpentry or plumbing. The trainee needs to work with someone who is skilled in the procedure and who then undertakes repetitive exercises with the supervisor to gain the necessary skills. 
For the last eight years, I've tried to identify eye doctors around Australia who would be interested in learning this technique. I've advertised in ophthalmic newsletters, spoken with groups of training eye doctors in every capital city of Australia, and I have been remarkably unsuccessful in this pursuit with only three eye doctors prepared to undertake the necessary intensive training and who now are able to undertake this surgery with a skill equal to mine. It is hard to explain why so few ophthalmologists would take up the opportunity to train in this technique. I can only hypothesize that the profit in their own land is never recognised. Or maybe it is too difficult. Or maybe it takes too long to do the surgery. Or maybe they are just too busy doing other things. This surgery results in a near zero recurrence rate when the pterygium is removed for the first time with a 1 in 3,500 recurrence rate with perfect for pterygium, while most other methods have a 5 to 15% recurrence rate, which means that it would come back in between 175 and 525 patients in a group of 3,500. However, when a pterygium has been removed previously elsewhere, the recurrence rate with perfect for pterygium is 1 in 200. This data is from approximately 500 patients, where the pterygium has come back between 1 and 9 times after removal by other surgeons. This certainly highlights that the first removal of a pterygium is by far the best opportunity for the patient to get a good result. There have been no blinding complications in the nearly 4,000 patients and only one patient has actually lost some vision as a result of the surgery. This is in comparison to a study which I undertook many years ago where two patients in a population of 500 who had received radiotherapy were blinded. I have personally seen six eyes blinded by the replacement treatment used nowadays, mitomycin. And the scientific literature has many publications documenting blindness from the use of mitomycin. Thirdly, and importantly for most patients, perfect for pterygium results in a near normal appearing eye, so that in most patients where it is removed for the first time using this technique, it is impossible to identify which of the two eyes of a patient has had the surgery. You should not be surprised that this procedure is not cheap. After all, it is the culmination of 20 years of research and is much more difficult a procedure to undertake and the surgery is much longer than most other pterygium surgeries. In comparison, this procedure is the Rolls Royce while the other surgeries are the everyday cars. Unfortunately, the Medicare system does not recognise any differential in pterygium surgeries. And in fact, it appears that Medicare views pterygium surgery as trivial, not even requiring a surgical assistant, which in fact is quite the opposite of the absolute need for an assistant with perfect for pterygium surgery. And the rebate is very low. So the out-of-pocket cost is significant if you wish to have perfect for pterygium. It is my hope that over the next few years, more eye doctors will come forward to be trained in this technique, in which case, I believe, 
the other techniques will eventually wither on the vine. I believe that a patient's time is as valuable as mine and I do not want them to spend any more time than necessary to see me. When I see patients, they're seen on time or before time more than 98% of appointments. No one waits longer than 15 minutes after their appointment time. They will also only see me. Not a few assistants before spending a limited time with the surgeon. They will see me for as long as it takes for them to feel confident about me as their surgeon and for them to have all of their concerns and questions answered. What is more, I do not operate on all patients with the pterygium, despite that being my sole business. I will give a fair and honest opinion of the advisability of surgery. To my knowledge, I am the only cornea trained ophthalmologist who has restricted their practice to pterygium patients only, perhaps the only one in the world. I have devoted half of my professional life to the study of pterygium and its treatment. I have published more clinical papers on the subject than anyone anywhere. I am proud of my achievements in tackling this common problem and would be happy to discuss perfect foot regime surgery with any patients from Australia or overseas. I have now trained two other ophthalmic surgeons in the technique and where they operate is listed below.